Sam Goody was an American standard of music retailing. Goody Got It was a slogan that brought something few others in the industry could. They were a common sight to mall goers, and at one time offered great deals, knowledgeable staff, and a unique buying experience. The following is their story, reaching back to the birth of the modern music industry and up to the present days of FYE. Today, our story takes us back to 1938 New York City, more specifically to a small toy and novelty shop in Lower Manhattan. Its owner was Sam Gutowitz, known to friends and family as Goody. One day, a customer came in looking to buy some old records. Goody remembered his apartment superintendent, who had a small, dust-covered pile of records in the building's basement. He paid 25 cents for them and resold them for $25. This unexpected profit made him reconsider his choice of industry. Music was hotter than he thought, and this pushed him to start selling records. Eventually, he opened a small record store which morphed into the first Sam Goody, what would become a pioneer in discount records. After World War II, business would boom. In 1948, Columbia Records introduced long-playing records, LPs, a standard we've used for over half a century. The extra inches and smaller grooves of LPs allowed for more music on a single record. This was great for continuous music, like classical, and was much less expensive to produce. These also gave the possibility to add separate tracks to create an album on one disc. Before this, if you bought an album, it would have been like a photo album, with a collection of several smaller records as part of a series. These often had artwork and liner notes, features that carried over to LPs, which matched with RCA's 45 RPM records would become industry standard. In short, this meant more music for less, and it breathed new life into the music industry. Record buying exploded like never before. Sam Goody was one of the original successful LP discounters. They had a famously extensive inventory, stocking nearly 40,000 records. They were dubbed the world's largest record and audio dealer. They ran some crazy sales, like one where they gave a free turntable to customers who spent a certain amount of money in the store, and there were thousands of customers in the store on a given day. In 1955, Sam Goody sold 7% of all LPs in the United States. The flagship West 49th Street location was the crown jewel of what had now become a small chain and New York staple. According to Mental Floss, employees at this store had to be the best of the best. Being well-versed in top 40 hits wouldn't cut it. Goody employees had an encyclopedic knowledge of all things music, from opera to punk, and he paid them well to do it. According to one employee who worked there, even part-timers received medical insurance, sick pay, vacation pay, and retirement benefits. By the late 50s, however, Goody began taking on debt. The debt wasn't just from absurd promotions, but also several unsuccessful ventures. At one time, they published their own catalogs, manufactured audio systems, and established a record club, all of which failed miserably. Heavy competition was a big toll on the company as well. There were more small competitors than ever, and big outfits like Abraham and & Strauss and Corvettes offered records at prices even lower than goodies. They were loss leaders, meaning most of their profits were in other merchandise, and they could afford to lose money on records. Goody relied solely on records for his sales. Since he was such a big buyer, his suppliers weren't too worried about debts. They let him pay whenever he had the money. Unfortunately, the 1958 recession hit hard, and suddenly everyone wanted the debts paid off as soon as possible. He ended up owing $2.4 million to these companies, among which were London Records, DECA, Capital, Columbia, and RCA. He filed for bankruptcy, and came out with an agreement where the debts would all be settled by 1970, but Goody found a way to pay this all off by 1966. 
Now they could get back to expansion. Next, they began expanding into shopping malls. Initially, they weren't interested in small units. They wanted big stores with a wide selection to generate high enough sales to offset their discount prices. In 1978, they had 28 stores. One of their big competitors was Musicland, also a mall-focused chain, owned by the American Can Company. They set their eyes on Sam Goody. They had nicer stores than Musicland and served older clientele. Surprisingly, they didn't put up a struggle. Goody sold for a measly $5 million, while they had sales of over $60 million. They were worth a lot, so why did they sell for so low? Well, there was a lot of infighting. Sam's two sons, Howard and Barry, were splitting the company over every little thing. He knew this would lead to the end of their relationship and of what he'd built for the last three decades. He put a stop to this as soon as he could and gave the company away at the first offer. After the family left, Goody's charm began to drain. A merger with Musicland formed the Musicland Group and started a joint focus on malls. This fueled major company growth, but the downside was that Goody was getting squeezed into a narrower footprint. It was ironic because their main draw was their massive selection of titles and they were being cheapened to a top 100 hit store. This lost them a lot of status and longtime customers. Musicland Group became one of the largest retailers of home entertainment products in the country. By 1986, they broke 500 stores. That year marked the launch of a movie retail chain called Paramount Pictures, which would become Suncoast Motion Picture Company. In 1988, they ran 15 Suncoasts, over 400 Musicland stores, and 200 Sam Goodies. The 80s was a period of great profit, with so much excessively popular commercial music and their pop-centric stock pushing a never-ending line of youthful customers into their stores. Chains like Tower Records, their biggest competitor, still had larger stores. One wonders just how much money Goody would have made if they kept larger stock. American Can, now Primerica, had hands in more than just consumer products, and they decided it made more sense to focus on their core businesses. Musicland's top management offered to buy themselves out via a leveraged buyout. The main problem with leveraged buyouts is that they usually set back productivity and load the company with massive debt. These managers wouldn't let that kill the company. They all took huge risks to keep positive profits after the spinoff. Investors took a chance on losing all their money to push the company through the early 90s recession, and it paid off big time. All subsidiaries were doing better than ever, and the company had quickly become the largest specialty retailer of LPs, cassettes, and video. Speaking of product lines, vinyl was dying. Most could afford to stock a decent vinyl selection in conjunction with CD, but goodies didn't have as much square footage, so they had to go all in. Despite only 10 to 15% of US households owning a CD player, music producers started dropping LPs before consumers stopped buying them. Goody was counting on this. They posted sales of over $700 million. Behind them was Tower Records at $650 million, and at number three was their next biggest competitor, Transworld, with $300 million. On August 8, 1991, Sam died at 87. He made himself a millionaire and a king of music discount by staying ahead of the curve and learning from his mistakes. It was smart for him to sell when he did. Taking early missteps with a grin and growing off humility, he built a legacy the stuff of other people's dreams. In the 90s, superstores were all the rage. Musicland was focused on the launch of their own big box chain, Media Play. Musicland had become an empire of about 1,500 stores throughout 49 states, the UK, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. It was getting too expensive to keep up. They had big competition in all their markets. Best Buy and Walmart had crazy, unchecked sales that made it hard to compete, and Media Play put them in direct competition with other superstores, like Barnes & Noble and Borders. Music sales hit a big slump, and shareholders lost a lot of confidence in the company. 
Their stock was falling despite attempts to stop it, and borrowing more money was not an option. By leaning on Sam Goody, the company avoided impending bankruptcy and was able to bounce back. The Musicland name was limiting, as they were selling more than just music, and went about rebranding most Musicland stores to Sam Goody. By 1997, the company was finally getting out of the red. They were showing decent prospects, but were servicing a large debt. In 2001, Best Buy offered to buy out Musicland. Best Buy had over 400 stores in the United States, with sales that year coming to over $12 billion. They bought Musicland for about $695 million, including the payment of their debt. The first order of business was the retooling of Sam Goody, in an effort to pull in younger mall goers. They opened them up to more electronics, like MP3 players, cell phones, and video games. A new parent was a step in the right direction, but the plan didn't work. A former Best Buy executive explained how arrogance had a big hand in ending Goody's turnaround. They didn't listen to Musicland's executives on what worked or not. They thought they already knew the secrets to retail success, whether their customers agreed or not. Meanwhile, the internet was destroying music sales, in legal and illegal markets. Physical music retail was aging quickly. Most young shoppers Best Buy wanted to entice were at home, downloading music on iTunes or Napster. Paired with dropping mall traffic, this made a lethal mix of ineptitude. It was costing them millions of dollars a year just to run the thing. Any plans resulted in more losses, and closures did nothing. In 2003, they turned the company over to Sun Capital Partners. There was no cash involved, they just gave it away. Three years later, Musicland filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection, blaming competition and music downloads. To their credit, Sun Capital really tried a turnaround, but there were too many variables in the market, and it was getting hard to convince someone that buying a whole overpriced CD was better than getting the exact track you wanted for just 99 cents. Transworld was making a much better go of things. They ran Coconuts, Strawberries, and FYE. They bought Musicland out of bankruptcy, and we've seen the results of that buyout. Over 200 Sam Goody locations were closed, and many others were converted to FYE. It's hard to exaggerate the significance of Sam Goody. Best Buy brought an important company turnaround to a screeching halt. You could see where their minds were, but rather than encourage leadership to do what was best for the company, they bloated their egos, and when they got tired of being wrong, they dropped the company like a hot potato. Music retailers like these are hard to find nowadays. FYE has much of the same merchandise, but Sam Goody was something special. For a long time, Goody did have it. Sadly, that didn't last. Even after the stores lost their pull, the name was always top-notch. They deserved a revival. At the very least, Sam Goody will be remembered for its strong brand power and unique story.